Good morning, uh, day 31, and uh, we are going to do the second part. Well, we're going to, it's the second video looking at the book of Jeremiah. I didn't really hardly got into it yesterday. Um, I've left this um, I've left this chart up behind me because it might be useful as we go through. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you some of the highlights of this book. This is the second largest book in the Bible, actually. And um, although it has fewer chapters than Isaiah, it's longer than Isaiah, and it's second only to Psalms in length. So there's a lot in here, and obviously I can't show it all to you, but I'm going to show you some of the highlights. Um, Jeremiah's call is given to us in chapter one, and Jeremiah was a young man when he was called. Um, and uh, verse four, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And he protests. Um, so often that people who are called by God to do something um, protest. You may remember Moses at the burning bush. Um, he was an old man, uh, but he made the same excuse. He basically said, I can't speak. I haven't got the fluency of speech. Don't make me do this. Um, and that's pretty much what Jeremiah says as well. Only he's a young man. Um, he says, "Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. And uh, God says to him, um, he touches his mouth. Um, interestingly, something similar happened to Isaiah, didn't it? And then he says this, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. We get this sense um, that uh, the prophetic call was an unwelcome one. Um, and it's not surprising, really. Uh, you look at what happened to people. So Jeremiah, as we're going to see, is going to have a very miserable life. Um, and all sorts of bad things are going to happen to that. I'm, I won't steal my own thunder. I'll, I'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, Isaiah, actually, we don't get an account of this in the Bible, but the, um, some of the extra biblical literature suggests that Isaiah was sawn in two at the end of his ministry. Um, we get uh, a sense of what, um, of what happened to the prophets in the New Testament, actually. Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and saying, Ah, oh, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and uh, don't listen to those that God has sent to you. Um, so the, the prophetic call was an unwelcome one. It was a difficult one to receive. And actually, as we're going to see in a minute, Jeremiah protests quite vigorously to God about the fact that he's been given this job that he never sought. Um, I'll look at chapter two with you as an example oracle. Um, remember that the, uh, so we know that Jeremiah is functioning mainly before the exile, okay? Um, and so, uh, which is here, um, and so most of his message is a message of um, condemnation, of urging, of imploring, of call, appealing to the people to turn back to God or warning them about what is going to happen because of their disobedience. So that's the bulk of his message. Um, we do get some words of comfort as well, um, which I'll show you as we go through. So this is a, a kind of sample of one of his oracles of, um, of condemnation. Chapter two. You may remember when we spoke about Song of Songs, I mentioned that the uh, the uh, metaphor of God as the husband and his people as the wife is quite a common one. Here we get it in Jeremiah. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. This is God through Jeremiah speaking to the nation. How you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Um, uh, and basically he goes on to say you've been unfaithful to me. Um, you you like an unfaithful wife to me. Um, there's a, a bit somewhere I was going to show you. Um, here we are. Quite a, a kind of strong condemning word, really. Um, what wrong did your, this is verse five, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and they went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? So in other words, they didn't they didn't notice that God was silent. Um, they didn't they didn't look to worship the true God. They just went after wherever they fancied worshipping. Um, they didn't sort of look around and say, where's the God who brought us up out of Egypt? The same word again, um, just a little bit later on, verse eight. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. So this idea um, of um, they did not look for, the, for the, the, the true God is a very important part of Jeremiah's message. And this idea of um, this condemnation of the religious leadership 
is also an important part of Jeremiah's message. The priests, the shepherds, which is when we understood as the, the leaders of the people, um, and the prophets, and they are all failing to seek out God um, for and with the people. This is a part, an important part of uh, Jeremiah's message. We'll pick that up again in chapter 6, um, which... Um, where Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah it has got this, this burden against um, the kings um, in the face of this rising threat from Babylon, in the face also of the threat from Egypt. He's got this burden to tell the people that um, the time of, if you like, the time of God's favour is coming to an end. The time of, of God's patience with them breaking and breaking and breaking the covenant again and again is, is, is ending. And judgment day is coming, which is, of course, this day, the day that Jerusalem falls. Um, and uh, and this is his burden. Now, that is not going to be popular. Of course, it's not going to be popular. I've already suggested that he got into trouble for, for that, as we'll see in a minute. But there are going to be other people who are going to be bringing um, opposing messages, who are going to be saying, all is well, all is well, all will be fine. Trust in God, all will be well. And Jeremiah, who's, who's got the authentic word from God, says all will not be well. Um, so in chapter 6, we see an example of this. Uh, pick it up at verse 13. Um, From the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. Uh, from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. So prophets and priests are being dishonest and they are doing it for hard cash or for advancement, for political advancement. Verse 14, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace when there is no peace. Just take a moment to unpick that. Um, as a, I used to be a doctor and uh, I know, although I wasn't a surgeon, that um, you don't heal a wound lightly. You know, if there's a pus there or an infection there, it needs to be dug out. Sorry, that's a rather graphic way of putting it. It needs to be excised. It needs to be treated. You don't just put some stitch, stitch over it or put a plaster on it because it will just separate from below. Um, I think that's the image here that Jeremiah is, is uh, saying. He, he's saying, He's saying that these false prophets, these, these unfaithful rulers are just papering it over. They're just smoothing it out and saying, oh, it's all fine. And actually underneath there's a kind of separating sore. Um, saying peace, peace when there is no peace. He's not criticising them for wanting to seek peace so much as for saying all will be well when all is not well. And it is a marker, I think. Uh, very clearly in both testaments, it is a marker of the authentic um, prophet or minister of God that they are willing to speak hard words when they need to be heard, um, that they cannot always speak words that are soothing, um, but sometimes they need to do what the surgeon does and um, excise that or lance that uh, boil, if you like. So that's a, an example from chapter six of of his criticism of the false prophets and leaders. Chapter seven, we get a temple sermon. Um, now the temple, as you know, is, is at the vital heart of the nation, the place where God is said to live. And uh, Jeremiah criticizes them for this, um, much as Isaiah did actually. You may remember, we looked at a place where he, God says, I'm fed up of your trampling of my courts and these all these sacrifices. Well, what, what are they to me when your heart's not obedient? Similar sort of message here in Jeremiah 7, um, when he says this, um, he says, don't trust in these deceptive of the word, words, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So in other words, that kind of mantra that says, you know, we've got the temple, we've got the temple, all is well, God is with us. Don't trust in that. It's not going to be faithful, as indeed we know, because we know that the temple is going to be destroyed. Um, so he says, that's no, not where your faith should be. Uh, your faith needs to be in God, not in the building, and your obedience needs to be uh, much deeper than simply um, talking about the temple and offering the occasional sacrifice there. Um, and again, it is an appeal to live justly. Social justice is a very important theme in many of the prophets, and we see it certainly in Jeremiah. So here he says, if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, that's the foreigner who's living among you, or the fatherless or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in this land I gave you. So social justice and idolatry, but social justice being, um, being foregrounded here. Um, 
So this is known as the Temple Sermon, where Jeremiah really tries to urge the people to shift their attention. I give you an example of one of his laments in chapter 8. Um, beautiful, actually, beautiful. And, and I think in our churches we don't lament enough, although maybe in these days we're starting to learn to lament a little more. Um, but the idea that we should always be kind of jolly or pretending that we're jolly and joyful is, is I think, an unbiblical one. And Jeremiah is a good example of that. So this is his lament from chapter 8, beginning at 18. My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick within me. Behold the cry of the daughter of my people from the length and breadth of the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? That's Jerusalem, remember. Is the king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images and with their foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wound. I mourn and dismay has taken hold on me. What beautiful words, I think. The wound of the daughter of my people is my heart wound. That, that sense of him carrying in his own body, as it were, the pain of the nation, that the people that he is called to serve. Um, chapter 18, I'm going to skip on a bit. He, a very famous chapter, he is sent down to look at a, a potter at his work and he watches this potter who's busy moulding this pot and he looks at the pot and he doesn't like what he's made and he squashes it back down to start again. And um, the message that God speaks to Jeremiah as he looks at this is about God's um, entitlement to change his mind. Um, now, I think we need to be careful how we interpret this because um, we, we learn from the, from the whole of scripture really that God um, is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's not fickle, he's not arbitrary. Um, but any time that we speak about God, we are kind of struggling with metaphors that don't fully represent him. And um, I, I think I mentioned a few days ago that we speak about God having, and the Bible speaks about God having a strong right arm and wings and a long nose and so on. Um, and, and so I think this language of God uh, reserving the right to change his mind also needs to be understood as a metaphor but nonetheless an important one. So he says, if I, um, if I threaten you with harm um, and you repent, then I'm going to, I, I reserve the right not to, give, not to send that harm upon you, okay? Um, likewise, if I make promises to you and you don't keep your side of the bargain, then I reserve the right to withhold those blessings from you, if you like. This is idea of the, that the potter has the right to start again with the clay. The potter has the right to look at what his, has emerged in his hands and say, I don't like that, I'm going to change it. Um, I think that's that's the burden, that's the message of chapter 18 there. Um, I'll just take you on to chapter 20. In chapter 20, Jeremiah has been put in the stocks for his words, which is a, a grim place to be. And there he addresses really bold words to God. Do you remember a few days ago we looked at um, Job and Job's bold words to God? Well, Jeremiah is equally bold, I think. Chapter 20, verse 7. O Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. I think that idea of deceit is perhaps more like you've tricked me. You've, you've, um, uh, you've got one over on me, if you like. I've become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. But whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction! For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. And listen to this. This is the this this verse is the verse actually that I think for many of us who preach would could be um, a word that defines how we feel about that. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in and I cannot. In other words, God has put this word within me and if I do not speak it, it will consume me. This is Jeremiah's word and I think for many of us who are um, charged with preaching, we feel the same about it. I'll leave you to have a look at that a little bit more if you'd like to. Um, Jeremiah 23, um, we get uh, a continuation of this theme of um, the, the, the leaders of God's people have let um, God and the people down and God says that he will raise up righteous ones instead. Verse, chapter 23 verse 1, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Um, you have scattered my flock and driven them away. Um, I will attend 
to um, you for your evil deeds. That's scary words, says God. And then I will gather the sheep that have been scattered and I will bring them back to their fold and they'll be fruitful and multiply. That sounds like God's promise to Adam, doesn't it? And I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. This is this emerging idea um, in the Hebrew Bible that God is promising a, a leader who will be faithful to his, his calling, a leader, a king, a leader, a prophet, a governor, a, a many, many metaphors are used, um, who will do the job well, faithfully, gently, tenderly with justice and righteousness and so on. We saw some of that in Isaiah, we're seeing that here again. Um, listen to this, which sounds very like something you read in Isaiah. 23 verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. If you remember this idea of the stump of Jesse, the stump of the house of, of David, um, it's been cut down and yet this little shoot is coming up at the side and this is this promise which Jeremiah refers to here that God made to David, that David will always have a man on the throne. A promise that Christians believe is leaning towards Jesus. Um, chapter 25. Um, chapter 25. Um, Jeremiah is is foretelling the Babylonian exile. We are we are getting closer. It's closer and closer. Um, Egypt is on the wane. Babylon is on the rise. And he says, "You are going to be defeated by Babylon." He says this again and again. And guess what? It's not a popular word. You're going to be defeated by Babylon. You're going to be deported, and you're going to spend 70 years in exile there. And um, if I remember, when we get to the book of Daniel, I will refer back to this passage because Daniel, who is living in exile, um, discovers this word and kind of looks at his calendar, as it were, and says, hey, God, 70 years are up. How about, you know, how about we see a turning point here? Um, and so we're going to yeah, note that because Jack Daniel will pick up on it later. Um, what else have we got in this chapter to show you? Um, I will pick it up actually in chapter 27. Um, in 27, continuing this same theme, Jeremiah makes a wooden yoke and he puts it on his shoulders. This is an enacted prophecy, this prophetic action like we've been talking about. And the message of this prophecy is you need to submit to the yoke of Babylon. This is a message to the king, surrender to the king of Babylon, wear his yoke. Um, and this is not a welcome word. Um, and in the following um, chapter, a, a false prophet called Hananiah challenges Jeremiah for this. And he actually goes up to Jeremiah and takes the yoke off his shoulders and breaks it and says, thus says the Lord, I will uh, break the yoke of Babylon and, and you know, and, and kind of tries to reverse that prophecy. But the word of God comes to Jeremiah, which he then delivers. Um, God says, you have, may have broken a yoke of wood, but actually I am making a yoke of iron that you will not yet break. This idea of the word that the Lord can't be countermanded by somebody who doesn't like it. Um, but also this idea that Babylon is coming. This is the fulfillment of the, um, of the threat for breach of covenant um, and that they need to submit to it because this is God's chastening. This is God's punishment. They should not resist it. Chapter 31, a real highlight, I think, in the book of Jeremiah. I love it. You could read the whole chapter um, and find much joy in it, I think. But let me show you something from verse 31 of that chapter. Um, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their forefathers that they broke. Um, this is the covenant I'll make with them in those days. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall anyone teach his neighbour saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. So what's, what have we got going on here? We, we see that the covenant that God and the people made at Sinai has been broken, at least at the people's side of it, although God continues to be faithful to it nonetheless even though they are going to go into exile but God doesn't let go of that and as part of him not letting go of that he says I'm going to make a new one or a new expression of the old one you can kind of different ways of interpreting this but but the idea is that something new is coming something better 
than the Sinai covenant is coming, um, when the law will not be on tablets of stone, will be written in the heart. And Christians believe that, um, and in fact Jesus taught Christians to believe, because Jesus uses this language of new covenant um, when he breaks the bread with his disciples in the upper room on, on Monday, Thursday. Um, so Christians believe that this is, again, this is straining forward to Jesus who brings about the new covenant that God makes with his people. Um, and a covenant where the Holy Spirit is poured out into hearts and shapes them to be Christ-like in their hearts rather than having to obey um, words written on laws of stone. I'm not suggesting the Spirit ever completes that work of Christ-likeness, but this is the, the idea of how the Spirit is operative in the new covenant. And Jeremiah is, is getting a glimpse of this, I think, and is, is straining forward to that promised future. Um, we're nearly there because I'm going to move fairly quickly over the last few chapters. Chapter 37 onwards, we get a quite a long biographical section. Actually, it starts in 36, where we get that bit where, as I mentioned yesterday, where the um, uh, where King Jehoiakim keeps burning the scroll. Um, so that's in 36. In 37, um, Jeremiah um, warns Zedekiah, this king here, um, so at this point, the Egyptians have temporarily beaten the Babylonians back and Zedekiah is very excited. He thinks the Babylonians are now a spent force. Jeremiah warns him, no, no, the Babylonians are just regrouping. They're coming back. They will conquer you. They will take you into exile um, and you are going to be um, defeated. And he has a, a word again also about what Zedekiah's own fate will be. In response to that, in 38, he is thrown down a well. Um, and he's only, fortunately, it's not a, it's a damp well, not a wet well, and his life is saved. Um, and then the second half of that chapter, um, Babylon, they do surrender to Babylon. And Babylon um, falls, uh, uh, sorry, Babylon uh, takes Jerusalem, but does not destroy it at this point. You may remember it was a kind of two-stage process. But the king sends um, a messenger to Jeremiah to say, Jeremiah, would you like to come to Babylon? We'll make you welcome there. I guess that he's heard these words that Jeremiah has been saying, you know, surrender to Babylon, um, submit to its yoke. And he probably quite likes that and probably thinks quite highly of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah chooses to remain behind. Um, and then among the remnant of the people, um, we get this, um, uh, we get this, urge to go back to, to, to Egypt. So among those who have not been deported to Babylon, they say, well, let's go to Egypt then. And Jeremiah's new message in these chapters is, no, don't put your trust in Egypt. Egypt will not, will, will not serve you well. Put your trust in God. Um, but nonetheless, they decide to go back to Egypt and Jeremiah um, is taken back to Egypt. And then we get a, a few chapters where we hear some of the oracles that he delivers while he's in Egypt. And then in the final chapter, chapter 52, which feels like an editorial edition, really, because at the end of 51, it says, thus far are the words of Jeremiah. And then 52 picks up and then we get an account of the fall of Jerusalem and how it is utterly sacked and how the temple is burned. Um, and that's kind of the end. And it ends in the same place that the book of Kings ends. Jeremiah's own fate is unknown to us. All we know is that he gets taken down to Egypt and then presumably he dies there in due course. But we don't know really how he dies. That's the end of the account of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. I um, hope that made sense. I um, hope I've shown you some of the highlights. Uh, tomorrow we will look at the book of Lamentations, um, commonly attributed to Jeremiah although I'm not sure that that's um, actually correct. But Lamentations is a lament for fallen Jerusalem, and we'll have a look at that tomorrow.